Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on provenance. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Honeyman. So, uh, provenance or lineage is, uh, or sometimes known as uh, pedigree, is a description of entities and processes involved in producing and delivering or otherwise influencing that resource. So I'm paraphrasing the W3C provenance incubator group description slightly here. Provenance provides a critical foundation for assessing authenticity, enabling trust and allowing reproducibility. Provenance assertions are a form of contextual metadata and can themselves become important records with their own provenance. So today we are joined by Carl Monick from the Bureau of Meteorology and Matthew Miles from the Department of, of Environment, Water and Natural Resources at South Australia. Uh, Carl, could you uh, expand a little bit? Um, Sure, thank you. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to uh, be passed on, uh, part of this uh, webinar. So I work for the uh, Bureau of Meteorology. I've been here for about um, 15 years and uh, uh, my work has been on um, in the observations field, uh, meteorological observations and maintaining uh, information related to that. Uh, uh, we call it observations metadata and uh, that's uh, important information to help us understand the, the history and the traceability and uh, to get trust in terms of the, um, the observations that we have in the, uh, in the Bureau. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been work, working in this meteorology field, uh, you know, I guess my entire career, uh, first in, in South Africa and more recently in uh, Australia. Um, these uh, observations are used uh, for the climate record, they're used for um, uh, meteorological uh, uh, op operations and for public information and so on. Um, I'm also part of the um, uh, a World Meteorological Organization uh, task team on what's called WIGOS uh, metadata uh, and we've produced a, a, a metadata uh, metadata standard for um, observations metadata uh, to help ensure the provenance of uh, the uh, observations that are, are collected around the world and I can uh, talk to you a little bit more about that at a later stage uh, but this uh, this standard has uh, been published uh, last year and it's available through the uh, uh, World Meteorological Organization and uh, it's, it's a standard for all types of observations, whether it's uh, uh, surface-based, you know, normal weather station measuring temperature and rainfall, or uh, drifting buoys on the oceans um, for satellites, for radars, and all these kind of things. So it's a, it's a broad scale standard, and, we've, uh, and it's, I guess, something that uh, has been recognized as really important. Um, so, and then my specific job is on in observing strategy, so we uh, look at uh, how observing networks, meteorological observing networks, uh, should be changed uh, and adapted for to be future fit. So uh, yeah, that's about uh, me. Thanks, Carl and uh, Matthew. Oh, thanks, Tom. Look, yeah, again, thanks for the opportunity to to um, present here and take part in this. Uh, it's great to have a conversation like this happening. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm with the South Australian uh, Department for Environment and Water. Uh, I'm a principal advisor uh, for our Environmental Information Unit. Uh, so I, I lead a team of spatial analysts and data managers who, who curate uh, environment and water and natural resources data in sort of in the realms of ecosystem science. So biodiversity observations, habitat mapping, soils, coastal information, native veg man uh, management uh, and the like. Um, these cover the whole of, of South Australia from the arid uh, regions through agricultural regions to the, the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, marine parks and, and, and everything in between really. Um, the team supports, uh, we, we support policy officers, legislative requirements, um, ecologists and, and project managers, um, on-ground uh, works and, and management uh, in terms of the landscape. 
essentially to have the right data at the right time in the right format that, that they need. So um, that's the, the task of my team. And so clearly um, understanding where our data comes from and how we process it and where it, where it is, is really, is really important. So, so we've come up with some provenance tools to help us, uh, help us lock that down. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Um, so the format today will be a panel. Uh, unfortunately, this panel is a, a little bit reduced in number. We've had, uh, uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, David Lisinski from Joint Geoscience Australia has had to pull out and he sends his apologies. Um, so uh, the format today will be the panel members answering some questions provided in advance. So feel free to ask questions as those questions are asked. Um, at any time using the question box, and I will insert these questions as we go along. Uh, I think we can uh, get straight into it. Um, Carl, if I could begin with you, uh, could you tell us why provenance is important in your field? Um, how do data consumers use the information or why do they need it? Okay, yeah, that's that's an important uh, consideration when we um, can think about uh, data and its use. Um, we, uh, in, in the meteorological uh, field, we need to understand the nature of the measurements and uh, make sure that they meet uh, or understand what standards uh, our, our observations meet. And uh, I think uh, most people intuitively would know that um, if we measure uh, temperature in different situations, Meanwhile, while it may be the same day, there will be different impacts whether you measure it on top of a, a car park full of uh, asphalt versus uh, out in, a, in, a, uh, in an area that's grass covered or so on. So uh, having some information about the nature of that measurement is really important. Now, our, our climate data users are really interested in the time series, the homogeneity of that measurement over you know, decades up to 100, you know, 100 or more years. And so uh, having information about uh, what is the source of that measurement, what are the characteristics of that measurement throughout that time series is, uh, is really important. And, and often they go into great uh, detail analyzing those time series and look for uh, what they consider inhomogeneities and, and then they'll go back into the, uh, the metadata, or the provenance data to see what, were, what is a potential cause of that. And um, so our, our information that we collect regarding the measurement is always historical. We, it needs to be um, uh, dated and, uh, and understand at what point it was relevant and how it changed over a period of time. Um, in our field, we also change our measurement technology, and uh, in in, um, for, in our in our use, use the temperature record, for example, as well. We started off measuring with uh, mercury and glass thermometers, and had uh, you know different models of those. And then over time, we've changed to electronic devices, uh, resistance thermometers or thermistors, and so on. And so those have some impact on the measurement characteristics. And so information on, uh, on all of those kind of things is uh, really important. Um, also, it's important to have uh, information regarding the siting and exposure of uh, where we do our, our measurements. Um, uh, you know, uh, trees may grow, buildings may be put up, and, and land surfaces may change, and all those kind of things have impact on the nature of that uh, measurement. And so um, that's, that's key to us. Um, and then um, uh, uh, we collect this information in Australia, but also globally, uh, we share uh, meteorological information through the World Meteorological Organization. And so it's important that we have um, uh, such information not just for our own data within this country, but also globally as well. And so, um, will the the WMO, if I can use it as a, a a little bit shorter, it's it's hard to keep meteorology running off my uh, tongue uh, easily. Um, they have uh, two different classes of of metadata. They have what they call discovery metadata, which is help 
helps people discover the data, uh, the, the data series um, and, and find where it's measured and what, what is measured. And then they call um, interpretation or description or observations metadata, which talks more about the nature of the measurement as well. Um, so uh, these standards have been established uh, globally and, uh, and all countries are, are uh, required or encouraged to meet these uh, standards. And uh, so there's now a global database uh, available where countries can upload their, uh, their metadata for all these uh, the observations that they collect and share internationally. Um, and, um, and I guess, uh, you know, the Global Climate Observing System, they have a statement and, 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 and their statement is, the details and histories of local conditions, instruments, operating procedures, data process, processing algorithms, and other factors pertinent to interpreting the data should be documented and treated with the same care as the, as the data themselves. So that sort of encapsulates the the, the types of things that go into um, uh, our, our metadata, our provenance. And then there's obviously from the measurement, uh, the processing of the data as it, as it moves on, the quality control processes that uh, are applied to it and any other um, uh, processes to, to uh, adjust for maybe inhomogeneities or, or so on. All that information needs to be understood and, and part of the, uh, the data set as a whole. So um, yes, to us it's incredibly important and uh, I think the Australian Bureau of Meteorology um, is, uh, I won't say leads the world, but it's one of the um, great examples in terms of our comprehensive metadata that, that we have at least over the last, um, um, since uh, the late uh, uh, 90s when we established our, uh, our, our comprehensive uh, digital database on metadata. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, Matthew, uh, the same question. Uh, why is provenance important in your field? Uh, how do data consumers use the information and why do they need it? So, uh, in in our field of uh, ecology or landscape science, the, the science and information that we produce, particularly from a government agency point of view, has to be transparent and, and defensible. Um, and so, uh, we do collect metadata about um, a, you know, a number of our um, data sets, particularly the ones where we're supplying authoritative data, um, whether that's uh, mapping data or coastlines and, and things that are highly technical um, in nature. Um, the difference here with our, our provenance tools is that it's the processing of, of information through our projects, uh, which we're capturing uh, the, the provenance of um, when multidisciplinary data sets get combined to produce um, answers or, or, or adv advice relating to specific policy questions or, or management questions. So um, uh, what we've found is that our, our project-based approach to, to collecting information and analysing information really hampers that, that transparency. Um, over, over the years, sort of poor data management practices, staff turnover, those kinds of issues make it uh, a real challenge to um, um, transparently record what, what's happened to, to data to, that have ended up in, in reports or, or advice. So these provenance records are really um, are needed to, to counter that. Um, um, we, we need to be able to defend the creation of the data, we need to be able to add to it, we need to be able to re reproduce it at times and on supply it and, and represent it faithfully. So um, uh, that, that's kind of why, why we need to do it. How do we use the information? Um, interestingly, the uh, the major consumers are, are, are project managers and others outside the, the initial project, uh, if you like. Um, it's kind of like paying it forward. The current project officers or people who are, who are doing the actual science, who are doing the work, they know where the data is, they know how it's been put together and, and to, to generate a, a product, but, but the next person doesn't. Um, the manager might not, the executive uh, might not. Uh, so we need um, to understand um, where these things come from and be able to, to document that for the, for the project managers. So um, 
Another key issue is that project proponents need to understand the resourcing required to manage data properly. Um, if, uh, if you've got a large multidisciplinary project, you might need to actually put dedicated resources into that uh, to do your data management and to maintain these, these provenance systems and to maintain the metadata associated with all of the, the data and the reports um, being being produced. So uh, that was another uh, reason for, for these, these provenance tools was to be able to upfront at the beginning of the project uh, forecast whether you're going to need some resources, a little or a lot, uh, in order to um, cover the data management requirements. Uh, they don't just happen by themselves, um, as people I'm sure listening to this uh, will understand. Okay. Um, before we move on, did you have uh, any questions for each other? Or would we like to move on to the next question? No, that's fine. Uh, okay, so Carl, uh, how did you decide what provenance information to capture? And how and when, uh, particularly in your workflows, uh, do you capture it? Okay, yeah, that's a, a good question because there is so much that can be collected and uh, and one needs to make sure that you collect what's appropriate and useful. And so um, I guess uh, part of our work with the uh, World Meteorological Organization has to be, uh, has been to set a, a, a standard set of metadata and, uh, and there's, uh, we've divided it up in, into 10 categories. And this is a cross disciplinary group, um, I guess in the broad meteorological uh, field, you know, it's had hydrologists, had uh, marine scientists, had uh, satellite uh, folk, it's had, um, uh, you know, um, radar and all those kind of things, which uh, we call comprehensive, but obviously just a little slot of the greater environmental area. Um, and so some of the, um, the uh, components that we've uh, put uh, into, well, the, the 10 categories that we've uh, got as our metadata is, um, is, is information about the observed variable itself, uh, its nature, its measurement characteristics, and so on. Um, secondly, it's the purpose of the observation. Why have you collected it? Because uh, that often uh, gives you information on, on, on the nature of the measurement how, and, it's, uh, and it's an, uh, how it's been used. Um, third is the information regarding the, the measurement uh, location, the station, the platform, um, uh, and, or, and, and things relating to that, whether it's a fixed station, a mobile station, uh, or some uh, remote sensing platform that might be um, uh, an aircraft or a satellite and so on. And the fourth category is to do with the, the environment environment, the geographical environment where the observation is made. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of information that's uh, useful there uh, in terms of uh, topography, uh, land use, and, uh, and so on. And then we have uh, the instruments and methods of observation, which is important um, because we know different instruments can record uh, uh, variables in, in different ways have different uh, characteristics and, and also the, the methods because um, whether it's a, a electronic method or a human-based method or some type of uh, chemical analysis all those kind of things are important uh, uh, characteristics to record uh, the sixth category is the sampling how are samples collected is it a uh, uh, um, you know, again, there's there's such a range of information regarding uh, sampling. Number seven is the uh, data processing and reporting characteristics. Um, how is how is this done? How are how are the statistics calculated? What data is thrown out and what is uh, carry uh, transmitted through to the uh, the final product and and so on. Uh, eight is the uh, the data quality. Um, what type of uh, data quality and traceable uh, aspects are provided to the uh, observation. Um, uh, what checks are done, um, is, the, uh, is the measurements, are the measurements compared against some international standard through some traceability chain and so on. 
Um, the ninth category is uh, ownership and data quality or data policy. Um, who, who owns it and what rights are there relating to the data and it's been, uh, how it's been used. And then the last category is to do with the, the, uh, the contact. How do you get hold of those who collected the data if you want to find more information? So, um, uh, so I guess that's, that's one way of deciding what information to capture. And then the, the second is how do we do it? And so, um, uh, you know, we, we've, we've got processes in place in our, in our, uh, in, in for our field staff who go out to uh, observation sites and they have a, a certain set of uh, metadata that they need to collect and update, much like that list that I, I just provided to you. So, um, so at the time, well, we have, Generally, in, in our field, we are collecting data continuously, 24-7. Um, and so our, our metadata is collected um, when we have uh, some type of change or visit uh, to sites, for example. And so we have a number of things that need to be done, the, the characteristics of the verification done, the photographs, checking that um, information on, on serial numbers and so on of equipment is, uh, is updated and, and so on. Um, any incident that may happen that may impact uh, observation, if we become aware of um, uh, a building that's been uh, put up nearby or there may have been, uh, you know, storm damage or, or any of those kind of things that uh, are, are collected and put into our, our uh, our, what we call our SitesDB database, which is our, our, our source of, of all of our metadata. And there's, there's you know, huge amounts and different types of information that um, have been collected. So this information is collected in the field, transferred into the, uh, the database, and, um, and then it's, uh, it's QC'd to some extent. Um, a, a manager will look through and make sure that it's uh, appropriate information that they haven't made a mistake in terms of, uh, you know, selecting the wrong uh, station or field or, or whatever to apply it to. And, uh, and then it's available right across uh, our organization for people to, to query and, and view and, and, uh, and so on. Um, so that's, um, that's a type of information that we collect. Um, I guess one of the things we've we've discovered and and uh, is that uh, photographs are often invaluable. You know, um, today we may think we need to know some inf information, and, uh, and but we haven't had the wisdom to collect that information uh, prior to this point. And uh, going back into photographs um, from the past uh, is often uh, solves some of those questions. You can see things that um, that were documented, or you can see from uh, characteristics what model equipment it was, or so, or something like that. So those are the uh, kinds of things that uh, that we collect. Um, you know, something as simple as the units that we measure in is important. Uh, we notice changes in um, uh, in temperature when we move from Fahrenheit to uh, using um, degrees Celsius. Um, we can see differences in uh, maximum temperatures if we change our observing time from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. That has been happened sometime in our past as well. Um, uh, positions of sites um, are also a real challenge. Uh, you know, uh, they may have been located on a one in 250,000 map the way degrees, minutes, and seconds are recorded uh, may, you know, in, in database conversions, it may be seen as, uh, instead of being uh, minutes, it may have been incorporated as, as decimal degrees or something like that. And so there's these uh, errors that can, can creep into databases uh, due to, uh, you know, the way data is managed. So um, those are all kinds of things that uh, we collect, and and I guess in terms of our workflows, we collect them, um, uh, try and collect them at source, 
and and uh, and bring them in and make them available to to our staff. Thank you. Yes. So um, that's interesting. Then, of course, with the the nature of your data is that there is that long tail uh, that goes. I was wondering if I could get you to talk a little bit more about uh, instances where uh, you might be uh, updating the provenance uh, of a record. So you, you mentioned that scenario with a photo where you maybe some event triggers you to realize that there might be some errors in the data and, and you want to go back. Um, now, presumably that applies all the way back into the history of uh, the records held by the Bureau. Um, yes. Yes, um, so that, sorry, did you want to finish? No, no, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so we have a, a, we have had some projects in the past where we, we call um, uh, back seeding because um, we have a lot of information that's available today or the, the, the last uh, uh, two decades that is electronic, but prior to that, it was all paper records. And so, um, um, for important climate sites and important climate records, uh, we've been going back to paper uh, files in order to um, to document some of that information, so we can get a more continuous um, um, record of of changes of of uh, information because because that's important. Um, it's a it's a really uh, um, uh, challenging area just in terms terms of database uh, management, uh, you know, for, for example, uh, you know, you, you may say in 1933, uh, you know, uh, a thermometer was uh, broken and, and, and replaced and it was uh, this model uh, thermometer. And, um, and so in your database, you put in a date and, and time and say that that happened then. And then uh, the next event you may discover is in 1960 something, and so there's this assumption that 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 thermometer was in in place from 1933 to 1965, uh, for example. And so um, that can you know if if there is a record missing in the paper file where there was another change made, uh, it can lead to to wrong understanding or assumptions uh, made in terms of, of that. So, um, so and, and, and when you discover a new piece of information um, and you want to insert it into that uh, database record, you also have to, you have to end the, the, re the life of the, the previous thermometer, for example, put in the new model and, and start it again. And so um, it is, there's, there's important training that needs to be Given to to staff who do that, and um, and so uh, you know we we do that because um, uh, there is so much importance put on our our temperature record and other rainfall records and and and, and such uh, such things, um, and so um, as we've gone through those exercises, we've also realised that there's additional metadata we need to uh, you know put in, and and so we've added to our repertoire of, uh, of metadata, but uh, uh, we're not always able to go back in, in terms of, uh, of that. Uh, I've got a quick question from the audience too. Um, Catherine Brady asks, uh, are these 10 categories of information captured manually, semi-manually or automatically? Uh, good, good question. So, uh, um, I guess a, a, a large number of are collected, I guess, semi-manually uh, in our our case. So um, a lot of the information is uh, is collected on site and either loaded into a laptop at that time, or it's uh, when they get back to their office that that's their opportunity to do that. Um, these days, we have more and more intelligent uh, equipment that is able to uh, report uh, its serial number and any changes that happen. And so we are, we are moving to a point where you, uh, you have more uh, automated information, but I would say the bulk of it is, uh, is manual assisted or, or, or manual in terms of its uh, collection. Uh, Matthew, um, let's turn to your question. Um, how did you decide what provenance information to capture and how and when in your workflows do you capture it? 
So thanks, Tom. Yeah, it, interesting. Um, the the level that we work at here uh, slightly different to the the sort of um, uh, foundational, if you like, or, or direct measurements for, from the bomb there. Um, so we had to work our way through working out what was important to understand when you want to resurface data or you want to access project-based data or the products of, of value-added analyses. So here, here's a report um, and it's made up of some maps and some photographs and some text. And, and so where did that come from? How can we uh, roll that back and, and, and understand what, what went into it? Um, Interestingly, so a lot of the data that goes into those reports is of the nature that, that Carl is talking about. Um, sometimes it's, it's climate information or it's direct observations um, from, from instruments. Um, other data types that we um, deal with are, are, are human observations, um, uh, for example, um, animal and plant sightings, for example. And we have standards around the kinds of information that's collected and then the, the metadata that, that goes along with those. Um, what we quickly recognised was that in our in, in our line of work, uh, we have IT systems that uh, hold metadata for a given format of information, uh, but it sits within that system. So whether it's a, a, a spatial database or it's a, um, a, a tabular system, um, whether it's our, our surface water data system or our groundwater database or our soils information, um, or our photo libraries, for example, they each have metadata associated with them, but it sits in that IT solution, if you like, in, in that database. What we needed was metadata for a project that said, um, okay, so where did you get that data from? Uh, and, and, and what did you combine it with? And then the thing that you produced, where, where did you put it? Next was to say, okay, so how has that, that product been evaluated. Who, who has done the evaluation? Who's done the um, the approval of that evaluation or, or a review of the evaluation? And then ultimately, who's authorised the release of the, of the product down down the line? So we have many people working on these projects, and as I say, often they're multidisciplinary. Uh, so we need to understand the the, the people involved. Um, and the decisions that are made as much as the, the actual data, the granular um, metadata about the, the, the data itself. Um, for example, like what uh, Carl is, is talking about. So, so we needed a new system. It was really a, a metadata system that, that sits across the top of our other uh, um, systems uh, and provides it at the, the, the level of a project. Um, so, we have a project management framework uh, that guides the way that the agency um, it gets gets money and undertakes projects, and that's about uh, planning the project uh, and then um, delivering the project and then reviewing the outcomes of the project and then closure of the project. So you your classic uh, Prince two or um, you know method for for running through a project. Uh, what what was missing was really the data management components of that. So we get into the second part of the question, how do we capture it? Uh, we tried to we work it into that project management um, approach and produced a series of tools that, that slot into each of those, uh, those parts of the project uh, management phases. So in the planning phase of the project, we produced a template uh, that, that records basically um, what are going to be your data inputs and outputs? What, what are you dealing with? Which IT systems are you going to be um, into? interfacing with or using in your project and who's making decisions in in the, the governance of the project. So really just letting the project managers get a focus on the kinds of information, the amount of information, who the audiences are and who's making the decisions along the way. So interestingly, a little bit different to just sort of a, a metadata about observed, uh, about observations. This is about metadata of the process of value adding um, in, in an analytical or a science based um, way. So we worked them into that project management framework. Um, we recognised that there was kind of a, a need to capture both sort of broad level information during the project planning to sort of get the resourcing right when you, you can't really go down into the detail at that sort of inception part of the, the projects, um, but then to gather more detail as each workflow in the project is, is, is executed. Um, so there's potentially change as you go through the project as well. So we produced a series of, of um, 
templates, uh, including uh, that planning form, uh, some charts, which are we, we call them data charts, which are a sort of a one-page summary of, of workflows that captures provenance of that workflow and the governance of that workflow, as I've, as I've mentioned. And then associated with that, we, we call it a catalog, uh, which is sort of a metadata system that allows you to capture uh, some of that more traditional metadata of um, um, where's it come from, its lineage, its location in space and time and all of those kinds of things, um, but really across the formats. So you could say from at a project level, um, here's a list of all of the information resources that were used in this particular workflow, irrespective of whether it sits in an Oracle database or, or an ArcGIS Esri database or a, an image library, um, or, or, or indeed a herbarium where we've got uh, samples or, or water samples. So um, the, the, the provision of those templates is sort of the first uh, process. We also found that we needed uh, some human support to that, uh, to really guide people to, to using the templates. It's one thing to just give them a template, um, but there was really a, a need for us to um, hold hands, if you like, help people through filling these things out, um, and really not because it's a difficult process, but it's really just learning that uh, and understanding the process of extracting that information and recognising what, what are the kinds of things that need to be captured. Um, ultimately, uh, probably even more so, probably not as much as we needed to collect information to for the data to be transparent and defensible at the end of the day, we're actually trying to raise uh, or improve data management culture right, right across our agency. So we really wanted project managers and project officers to understand um, that it's it's not that difficult uh, to, to write these things down. Um, and indeed, if you plan it into your project and put some resources into it, um, then it, it, it makes it much easier to find this information later on down the track. And as I mentioned um, earlier, it, it really is about paying it forward here. Um, the project officer will often defend themselves and say, I know where all my data is, I know where it's come from, I know where it's gone. But um, once that person's left or a new officer comes in or indeed a, a data manager or a data provider, uh, if a member of the public rings up and says, okay, um, map three in this report here, uh, which has been made public, can, can I get the data from that and do something else with it? Um, if the people aren't around who know where it is, then we need some records around that. So um, really trying to produce these templates and tools that enabled the project staff to, to learn how to do that and then see the value in, in those products, uh, which often, um, uh, ironically, doesn't, ha doesn't often present itself until a bit down the track. So it's not until the project's been finished or nearly finished uh, that somebody wants to produce the data, uh, that you can go to these records and really see that value. Um, a really good example is, is we often have uh, a project that might be completed, and as I say, the final output is, is a report. Um, often it's a report these days um, with electronic uh, communications and uh, it, it, people and, and open data, people are wanting the data that goes into that report as well. So it's really important for us to know uh, which, which element of the workflow can we release in the data sets. Do we want to release the raw data, the kind of stuff that we might be getting from, from Carl's area, or is it the value add where we've done some combination, some summarising, some analysis um, and produced a graph, for example. So when someone comes to us and says, oh, that project that happened you know, last year or you know, was published last week, um, can I have the data, please? We really needed a way to uh, investigate, well, which bit of data are they actually talking about? Is it the map? Is it a layer in the map? Is it the graph? Is is it the table under the graph? And so we ha we're trying to um, improve, and I guess um, Im improve the language around data management and, and data workflows and analytical workflows um, so that we make sure that the data that we're releasing um, is actually the stuff that's been uh, quality assured by, you know, through our processes. These are all what process the quality assurance and approvals are already embedded in the way that we, that we run our projects, uh, but we 
weren't doing such a good job at capturing that to understand that so that if somebody um, that wasn't involved in the creation of the project comes along and, and, and wants to find out that information so that we can pass it on or, um, or, or um, as I say, transparently, you know, look into that. Uh, that was really what we needed to, to, um, to gather. So um, helping people to use these templates and then recognise that you do it at the beginning of the project, you might review it in the middle of the project, and then you need to review it at the end of the project to make sure that, you know, as things change, through the project, uh, you end up with a, a decent record at the end of it. So I think really important to, to have the templates is to also have, uh, and this is where my, my team comes into it, that support that allows uh, the projects to, to recognise the value um, as soon as they can uh, what these products are. I guess following on from that, my team also then, for those people that provide that support to the projects, we get them together on a monthly basis and they can they talk amongst the, each other about uh, any patterns that they're seeing or any products that we need to improve or extra products and new products we, we might want to develop. Um, so that allows us then to, to sort of complete the circle, if you like, to, to keep a finger on what information do we need to capture next time? Are, are we getting it right? Uh, and so in that way, we're trying to embed this system of improvement in terms of data management, um, the language and the culture around uh, how, we, how we can make our science transparent and, and defensible at the end of the day. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we've actually got a few questions uh, from the audience, um, mostly around the, the templates. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, Ming Fang Wu asks, um, is the is the metadata um, a standard, or is it an in-house developed one? It's an in-house developed one. Um, I, I looked into things like Prov uh, and and recognised that they were um, much more. Um, at the end of the day, machine to machine oriented, if you like. Uh, they really enabled uh, some very clever technical um, uh, comms uh, and, and um, uh, uh, what's the word? Discoverability and uh, accessibility at that machine to machine end. Um, as I say, the focus for us really was about raising our awareness of data management so we we wanted something that was more um, human to human if you like uh, and we didn't have a lot of resources to uh, develop templates that were in a in a, a, a flash um, interface um, on on the computer screen so we simply uh, got PowerPoint templates going. Um, it was really just about making sure that we've got a, a simple, something that's accessible, all project managers, most people can drive PowerPoint, uh, give them some templates to put icons on the page that, uh, that tell you whether it's a, a spatial layer or it's a table of information or it's a database or it's a video or it's a photo. Um, and then just put in processes in between those um, that capture how the, the information was combined and then what did it produce. And as I say, who did the quality assurance and who did the approving um, of the product coming out uh, at the other end. So no, I uh, didn't, couldn't find a standard for that, uh, that particular um, process, so it was in-house developed. Um, so uh, Ming Fang also asks, uh, does the metadata change from project to project um, or is it a standard template that um, uh, applies across the board? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. What we've found is that um, it's evolving. Um, it, it, yeah. it, some of the, the things that we, at a base level, that we wanted uh, to capture is is the data classified? What classification does it have? So in, inside government, we classify things as whether they uh, have any sensitivities, whether they're for official use only, whether they're cabinet sensitive, or whether they're public data. So it's got to be classified. So we capture the classification, um, any licensing, if it's open licensed uh, or not. Um, and then who's done the authorization, who's done the evaluation. So in, a, in that sense, they are pretty well uh, locked in. Um, the way that we capture those though has has kind of evolved. Um, so depending on the type of project, we're finding it very um, uh, very applicable to any of the different projects that, that we have going. So uh, we, we're not rigid about the kind of information that we're collecting. As I say, in um, almost more than the data that we're collecting at a corporate level, uh, 
um, the value in this is a business area getting to understand its own data management needs and the way that it, uh, it, it stores and value adds information through its, through its workflows. Okay, so thanks for that. Um, we've got uh, 14 minutes remaining um, and I think we've actually uh, got a strong sense of what the main challenges are in capturing provenance information uh, in both your organisations. Um, but I wanted to give you a chance to uh, maybe uh, raise any other um, uh, challenges, starting with you, uh, Carl. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We we do have a few few challenges that I wanted to highlight. One is uh, consistency in uh, in information, and uh, so often where uh, where possible, we use uh, you know tables of information that they can select instead of you know uh, user entry. Um, what's also a challenge is communicating the value of metadata um, uh, to those who are you know, in, in decision makers, because often uh, in terms of the short term, they don't see the value of it, but we, you know, we recognize the value over the, over the longer term. Um, it's uh, uh, privacy is an important uh, aspect because, um, um, you know, recording who uh, entered the metadata is, is important because sometimes there can be a, uh, you know, this person always does it this way, or something like that. And so, if you can, if you can do that, but we don't want to necessarily record their name and and, and so on. So, you know, that that kind of information is um, important. And uh, I guess ongoing motivation of staff is also important uh, because they keep doing the same old thing. At, you know, every site that they go to, and so in the beginning they can be well motivated and be uh, uh, comprehensive in their metadata and, and then over time you know if they, they're on a two-week trip driving around uh, remote parts of uh, Northern Territory or something they, they start their, their enthusiasm lags a little bit and so ways to encourage them and to, to, to monitor that is uh, important uh, um, and um, and then also uh, you know, to identify what's missing. That's uh, uh, something that's not there. It's, it's very difficult to identify remotely. So to how do you find, uh, how do you have a process in place to 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 document those things that uh, somebody may just not, 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 not see? And we find, you know, we have a number of uh, skills in terms of our staff. We have those who have a, a greater meteorological understanding and then those who are maybe more more engineering technical, and uh, they might not understand things that influence the measurement of uh, of one of our meteorological variables, and so they may not recognise the the impact that um, you know a, a new let's say a new building next to an observing site might have uh, uh, with you know maybe radiation reflecting off the building and and increasing the the, the uh, the heat load of, of the St Stevenson screen. So I guess those are, are um, uh, I guess, oh, and one last thing is um, is database changes. You know, there's always uh, a need to update databases, move them to new, uh, uh, you know, uh, software systems. And sometimes those those changes, assumptions can be made about certain fields, which will change the nature of them. So that. That's that's uh, that's uh, the challenges that we face in, in the Bureau of Meteorology. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Matthew, do you want to uh, uh, highlight any other um, challenges in capturing provenance information? Sure. Um, I think that um, convincing staff of the value. Um, I, I concur with Carl completely there. Um, Providing some demonstration that uh, that, that that there is uh, value in doing this extra task, uh, as small as it may be, um, uh, but it's it's always later in the project uh, or down even later down the track um, when you need to understand the the data products more deeply um, or from an external viewpoint. 
um, or you need to access it. So um, one of our challenges is definitely that ongoing demonstration of, of the value uh, the value proposition here. Um, having said that, we are finding that the value does present itself. Um, when we start working with, with projects, uh, it, it only takes one or two instances. Some people get it straight away, um, but it only takes one or two instances of somebody who, who wasn't quite sold um, at the start uh, when, when a certain request comes in and they need to understand something. Uh, we've, we've had managers who've um, needed to make a, a, you know, a rapid decision about whether or not to release a, a, a certain component of, a, of an analysis uh, and our, our charts are, are very much enabling that um, for them to rather than spend time deliberating how might, where, where did this come from, who did the evaluation, does it have good quality, um, that's, that's really te um, demonstrable, uh, demonstrable through, through these things. Um, two more challenges I guess, one is, is our ongoing development of the tools. Uh, so we we knew that we needed a, a, a framework to manage uh, these these governance processes and these workflows, um, and we were able to put some time to that. It took us a good couple of years to really um, work our way through this and get to some reasonably mature templates. Um, but we are finding that they could do with uh, further development, as with any kind of um, information system, I guess, as we we learn um, slightly better ways of doing things. Um, there is definitely a challenge in, in keeping that level of effort up um, as uh, other priorities come, uh, come to bear. I guess the other thing is that, um, it, and, and these are good challenges in a, in a sense because it, I guess it shows that the system is working, um, for our, our officers and our, and our project uh, participants to understand some of the, um, the standards around classification and review um, quality assurance. Um, indeed, the standards around where we store our data, where we store different types of data. Um, that feedback loop of uh, people then recognising that there is uh, a corporately supported way or, or certain structured databases that you can engage with. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good challenge that comes out of this, um, is people actually upskilling um, and working so that our data management is better right across the board. I think they're our main challenges uh, in trying to keep this system uh, going and growing. Oh, thank you. Um, Matt, we've got a, a question from Abbott Blaze in the audience. Um, he wants to know who is responsible for collecting and collating the, uh, the governance metadata. Uh, so, uh, who is responsible for it, so the governance of the governance. Uh, we, we try and encourage the projects themselves to, to own that, uh, that task. Um, it's when projects are um, initiated inside government, there's a clear line of governance one way or another. Um, that might simply be a, a line of management and then the person at the top of that line gets to you know, sign off on the, on the final products. Um, what we try and do here is, is embed the understanding with the project, uh, the project officers and, and the middle managers in particular um, uh, to, um, to be able to you know, describe that governance. So we really try and just provide support for them to document that governance. Um, but the responsibility itself, we, we put into the project itself. So all of these are project resources. Um, I guess another challenge that we're, that we're looking at is if we've got six or eight or ten projects that are all collecting this information, how do we compile that uh, to get a deeper understanding at a corporate level or at a meta level um, what's going on? That's not really our focus at the moment. I think that would take a whole lot more resourcing. Um, at the moment, as I say, we, we're, trying, we're pushing this back to be of value to the projects themselves to help them execute and, and um, maintain transparent and defensible um, workflows. Um, so, so that governance here, yeah, we, we try and keep that in the project itself. We support it from, from outside, um, but we want them to own uh, the, the, the need and the value of collecting that governance information. Uh, Ming Fang has uh, had a comment um, a to summarise the, the panel discussion, uh, basically that um, 
good data management uh, practice and training and anticipating down, da downstream data use are the two top keys for Providence. Uh, I, think, I think I can agree with that for sure. Um, but uh, I think we've also had a lovely contrast here. Um, obviously, authenticity and trust are, are, are paramount um, in capturing this provenance information. But the, the challenges uh, between uh, the two organisations vary from, um, from data quality issues uh, to, uh, I guess, organisational or, um, or a culture change yeah. type uh, angle. Um, thank you. Um, did you have any questions for each other? Um, and also, this is your chance if you're in the audience uh, with four minutes remaining uh, to throw in any more questions. No, but uh, well, maybe uh, for Matthew, in terms of um, you talked about incorporating uh, different data sets to make a, a product and, and you keep some traceability on, on uh, what uh, uh, changes happened to that data and how it was incorporated. If you could uh, just very briefly explain that, that, that would be uh, interesting to me. Sure. Uh, thanks, Carl. Uh, that's really um, so. These these charts that we have will will you know we have we have an icon here. Say we've got a uh, say we've we've gone out into the um, into the some location and we've taken some photos and then we've written some stuff down in in a table uh, and then we 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 bring those back. Uh, we might have taken some video. Um, we bring those back and and. Uh, in the chart, we simply have a box that says analysis or compilation or derivation or summarization, and then and then just a few dot points underneath that of, of what actually happens. So we might say, um, look, one of our really good examples is our underwater um, dive surveys uh, for our marine parks monitoring. So uh, the guys go out with the boat and they tow videos behind the boat. Uh, and they collect fantastic uh, videos of, of fish feeding on on, on bait. Um, they bring that back into the office and they run it through some software that uh, that can recognise different species of fish and counts the species of fish and then and puts those into 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 tables. So so we can say uh, you know we collected the video and we wrote down the date and the time etc. Um, and then we then we process that um, and we. We extract from that or distill from that a table of, of species count, for example. And then that species count data, that table then goes into our biological observations system. Um, and then that can, can be either supplied onwards or goes into uh, some kind of understanding of the, a species richness over time in that particular location. So um, to capture the, the, the processes in there, we, we simply say compilation or analysis, whatever, whatever makes sense for the project, and then a couple of dot points about what they actually did. And so whether they can record in, oh, we used the MaxSense soft, Max software, or, uh, you know, and then we put the data into such and such a database. So um, again, it, it's really what makes sense to, to, to understand that, uh, that part of the project so that somebody who externally can come and look at this thing and say, oh, I see what's happened. You know, you've collected some video, you've run it through some software, and this is the table that's been output. Um, again, it's a very human-oriented and user-oriented uh, thing rather than a machine-to-machine. A -machine. You certainly couldn't get a machine to read these PowerPoint uh, <laughs> charts um, and, and, and then go and get access the information, but maybe one day down the track, uh, we, could, we could get closer to that. Uh, so, in the remaining seconds, uh, Matt, uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, are those templates that you use, are they, uh, are, they are they available? Are they open source? Um, um, yep, they will be. So, we'll make them available with uh, with the recordings from this uh, from this web. Uh, um, they're certainly not polished, uh, but we and, and and they are internal resources that we use uh, within the agency. But we're going to make them. Uh, the, the links obviously won't work to our internal systems, uh, but certainly the format of them, and we're very happy to share that and and hope that people can uh, yeah make use of them. Okay, so my apologies to the uh, questions that I didn't get to, but we've run out of time. Um, Thank you very much to uh, Matthew Miles and Carl Monick for joining us today. Thank you also in the background to Susanna Bacon, to uh, Kerry Levitt and Julia Martin and Ming Fang Wu for helping set up this uh, prominence panel. Uh, and thank you to everyone for attending today.